This evening we're continuing our examination of the names of God, which we find sprinkled all throughout the scriptures. And by way of review, I'll first remind you that we began this series by exploring five names which all begin with the Hebrew word El. As a result, we learn that the name Elohim points us to the triune nature of God. Then we learn that the names El Shaddai and El Gabor point us to the all-powerful nature of God. Then we learn that the name El Olam points us to the everlasting provision and protection of God. And then in our study last week, we learned that the name El Elyon points us to the exalted state of our supreme king. Well, now here in our study tonight, as we move forward in this study of the names of God, we're going to shift our attention now from the names that begin with El, and we're going to turn our attention to the ten descriptive names that begin with Jehovah. But before we begin our examination of these ten compound names that begin with Jehovah, we should first begin by defining the origins and the meaning of the name Jehovah. With this as our focus, I'd like you to open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 3. You see, it's in Exodus 3 where we find Moses. He's tending the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro. And as Moses led this flock to the back of the desert in search of greener grass, he soon found himself at Horeb, which became known as the Mountain of God, or you might recognize it as Mount Sinai. The reason why this mountain became known as the Mountain of God is due to the fact that this is the mountain where God revealed himself to Moses and would later reveal the Ten Commandments to Moses. With all this background in mind, if you would look with me there at Exodus chapter 3, I want to begin reading at verse 2, because there we learn that the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and, bring, and to bring them up from the land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites, and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them, Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring the children of Israel out to Egypt? So he said, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Now, here in these verses... We find the Lord here, he's revealing himself to Moses there on Mount Horeb. And just to be clear, the Lord here is now revealing himself to Moses as the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. It's also interesting to note here that this word God, which is translated in this text, it is translated from the Hebrew word Elohim, which we've already studied. The Lord was revealing himself to Moses as the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Isaac, and the Elohim of of Jacob. But then after referring to himself by the name that points us back to that, that plural nature or what we discovered is the triune nature of God, the Lord then goes on to present Moses with his proper name. And with this is our focus, if you would look with me, beginning there at verse 13, because there we learn that Moses said to God, indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. 
Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. Here in these verses we find the Lord, he's now revealing his name to Moses. And while he refers to himself as Elohim several times throughout this conversation, the Lord also then calls himself Haya Haya, or in English, I am who I am. And listen, this, the Lord wasn't giving Moses this flippant answer. He's saying, hey, uh, Lord, who, who are you? What's your name? And God says, I am who I am, you fool. Don't you know? He's like, yo, homie, don't you know me? No, he's not giving a flippant answer like that. This, this name isn't just God kind of being sarcastic. It's, it's actually God trying to communicate some very deep truths to Moses. He was presenting Moses with a name which is philosophically challenging and theologically enlightening. In order to explain what I mean, it will help us to understand that the Hebrew word haya, which here is translated I am, it would be more accurately, accurately translated I exist. Seeing how the Lord declares this name twice, haya haya, and, and seeing how this is both times in the imperfect tense, it seems obvious to me here that the Lord was essentially telling Moses that he is the God who has always existed and will continue to exist forever. He's saying, hey, I exist, I exist. I've always existed, I always will exist. It refers to the infinite existence of God, and that doesn't mean that God has existed for a very long time, but rather what it means is that God is existence. Then in order to drive this point home, the Lord restates his name there at the end of verse 14 by, the, by directing Moses to go and say to the children of Israel, I am, or I am existence, has sent me to you. The Lord was telling Moses to inform the Israelites that he was sent to serve the God who actually exists. And that's very interesting because uh, of all the gods that have ever claimed to e exist or of all the people who have pointed to some other god and said, this is the true God, the God of the Bible is saying, no, no, I'm the one that exists. All these other gods, they don't even exist. But I'm the one who actually exists. Now, uh, excuse me, in order to further grasp the deep meaning of this name, if you would turn with me to, to the fifth book of the Bible, which is the book of Deuteronomy, I'd like you to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. <clears throat> you see, it's in Deuteronomy 6 where we find Moses now. He's summing up all the commandments that he had received. He's summing up the statutes and the judgments of the Lord. And he did this by presenting the children of Israel with a statement of faith which has come to be known as the Shema. If you would look with me there at Deuteronomy chapter 6. I'd like to begin reading at verse 1. There Moses writes, Now this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, you and your son and your grandson, all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. Therefore, hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you a land flowing with milk and honey. And then here's the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Now, here in these verses we find Moses, he's encouraging the children of Israel to put God first in their lives. And he's saying, hey, God has given you a bunch of commandments. He's given you uh, a bunch of judgments, a bunch of statutes that, that he wants you to follow. And if you would just put him first in your life, then all these things will, will 
take care of themselves. If you just put him first, and, and if you fall in love with God first, then you're going to have this desire to do what he's calling you to do. And so he's saying, hey, just, just keep God first. Love him first. Put him first in your life. And it's interesting to note here that he not only refers to God by the name Elohim in this text, every time you see that word God, he's he's using that word Elohim, but he also uses a derivative or or, or a word that derives from the name I am. That name I am that we found back in Exodus chapter 3, we find this word Lord derived from that name. With this in mind, notice with me again there in verse 1. There Moses refers to the commandment, the statutes and judgments, which the Lord, your God, has commanded to teach you. In verse 2, Moses also declares, fear the Lord, your God. In verse 3, Moses refers to the Lord God of your fathers. In verse 4, he insists that the Lord, our God, is the Lord is one. And in verse 5, Moses instructed the children of Israel to love the Lord, your God, with all your heart with all your soul and with all your strength. Now, in each of these verses, the word God is being translated from that Hebrew word, Elohim, which we studied in the beginning of this series. But the word Lord here, it's found there in all caps. It's translated from the Hebrew consonants Y-H-W-H. And this Hebrew word made up of these four consonants, this is what scholars refer to as the tetragrammaton. And it's actually the name, which, again, I point out, is derived from that Hebrew root word, haya, which was found back in Exodus chapter 3. Haya was that name that God presented to Moses in Exodus 3, and here Moses is presenting it as this singular name. That being the case, every time you see the word LORD in all caps, well, that's an indicator to let you know that behind that English word LORD in all caps is found the Hebrew tetragrammaton, which scholars translate into the names either Yahweh or Jehovah. There is some debate about which way to actually translate that, but I think both are legit. One example of this can be seen in the American Standard Version of the Bible. As a matter of fact, the ASV scholars rendered Deuteronomy 6 verses 1 through 5 like this. Now this is the commandment, the statues, and the ordinances which Jehovah your God commanded to teach you that ye might do them in the land whither ye go over to possess it, that thou mightest fear Jehovah thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command thee, thou and thy son, and thy son's son all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged." Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily as Jehovah, the God of thy fathers, hath promised unto thee in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, Jehovah our God is one Jehovah, and thou shalt love Jehovah thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. As we consider how the scholars of the American Standard Version, they reinsert the proper name of God back into this text, you might be wondering, why would the scholars of our most modern versions of the Bible replace the name Jehovah or Yahweh with this word LORD written in all capital letters? Why wouldn't all of our Bibles just have the name of God there? Well, one reason for this is due to the fact that the Jews had such a high regard for the proper name of God that they actually decided to stop speaking this name out loud somewhere around, the, uh, around 400 B.C. They, they, just, they, they, want, they revered it so much that they just said, you know, we're not, we're not even going to say the name anymore. Then in the public readings of the Old Testament, whenever they would come to the name, the Jews would replace the proper name of God with the Hebrew word Adonai, which is translated into our English word, Lord. And when the Old Testament was then translated into Greek in 300 B.C., the Tetragrammaton, which occurs almost 7,000 times in the Old Testament, was translated from that replacement title, Adonai, to the Greek equivalent, Kyrios, which also means Lord. Therefore, our 
the, the, the Septuagint, and then everything that, that came translated from that presents us with Lord instead of YHWH. Now, you might be thinking, well, that's, that's a bummer. I mean, that's... Well, before we start pointing fingers at scholars and wondering why, and I would just point out that Jesus himself followed suit with that common practice. He used the Greek title Kyrios when quoting the Shema from Deuteronomy chapter 6. In order to prove my point, let's turn over to Mark chapter 12. As you make your way to the 12th chapter of Mark's gospel, I'll point out that we find a group of scribes here and, and as so many religious leaders did in this time period, they're attempting to trap Jesus with a trick question. And it's here in the 12th chapter of, go, uh, of this gospel account that Mark tells us, beginning there at verse 28, that one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? They're trying to trap him. They're trying to trick him because if Jesus picks commandment number five or commandment number seven, or if he picks one of them, then they're going to say, aha, you know, they're all equally valid. Well, Jesus knew what they were up to. And there in verse 29, he answered him, the first of all the commandments is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. Now, if anyone knew the original text, and if anyone knew uh, you know, the, the name of God, which was found there in the original writing of Deuteronomy chapter 6, it would be Jesus. And yet Jesus follows suit with the modern Greek translation by using the word kyrios three times as he quotes the Shema. That being the case, uh, I would say that this, this custom of the day, Jesus seems to be approving of it to some degree. Jesus used that Greek word kyrios, which of course is translated Lord, and, and, and he did this rather than using that proper name, which was derived from the Hebrew word haya. At the same time, uh, it's good for us to also realize that whenever we see the word Lord written in all caps in the Bible, that we not be confused by it, but that we just recognize that the word Lord in all caps means that the original text had the name of God there. And if you like to reinsert the name of God back into the text as you read the all caps, go for it. I do that sometimes. Whenever we see the word Lord in all caps, we should instantly understand that the proper name of God was actually being used in the original language. And this proper name, which again, it could be translated Yahweh or it could be translated Jehovah, it's a name that actually speaks of the everlasting existence of God who was, who is, and who will always be. That's what the name actually points us to. And with that, I want to take a moment to consider this concept of God's infinite existence and listen this name jehovah i believe that it's designed to help us to better grasp the infinite existence uh, existence of god because it's a name that presents us with the isness of god what do i mean by that what is the isness of god well to put it more plainly the name jehovah points us to the fact that god is in and of, of himself the very essence of existence God is existence. Therefore, whatever God is today, he always has been. And whatever he was in eternity past, he always will be forevermore. And we tend to think about, you know, infinite existence as being just made up of a whole bunch of moments. But that's not God. God isn't this being who consists within a whole bunch of time. And as far as you can think back in time, moment by moment, God was existing then. And as far as we can think forward in time, moment by moment, God is still going to be existing at that point as well. But you see, this is very creation-based thinking. Understand for a moment that God created time. He's not bound by it. 
Therefore, God isn't this being who has existed for many moments forever, but rather he just is. When he says, I exist, I exist, or I am who I am, he's just saying, hey, I am infinite existence. And I don't know about you, but that just blows my mind. I can't even begin to grasp what that could even look like, that God has just always existed, but yet, you know, the philosophers and the naturalists want to come along and say, well, who created God? But I would just point out that God is the uncreated creator. No one created God because God doesn't need creating. He just is. That's the isness of God. God is the only being who has just always existed and just always will exist. He just is. And what that also tells us then is that God has absolutely no potential for change. And that's a very important distinction to make here. You see, we all have potential for change. And I guarantee that every single one of us would like to get better at what we think is valuable and important. Case in point, at the beginning of every new year, what do we do? We start making resolutions to try to become better people. What this means is that we have potential to change and become better at the same time. We have potential to change and become worse. But with God, he has no potential for change. He just is who he is. And the beautiful, the beautiful thing about that is that he's perfect. And so why would he ever need to change? He doesn't need to get better because he can't be any better. He is perfect. And since he'll never change, he'll always be perfect because he is perfect existence. That being the case, I believe the name Jehovah is designed to help us to grasp this important truth about God. You see, this name Jehovah, it helps us to understand that the true and living God, the God who actually exists, is the unchanging one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so he's consistent. And he's consistently perfect. And he'll always be the good and gracious and loving, perfect God that we know him to be today. And what's even more beautiful is that we don't even fully grasp how good and perfect and, and, and how awesome he is today. Therefore, we'll continue for the rest of eternity to explore how incredible this perfect God who never changes actually is. Not only that, but the name Jehovah, it's also a name that should remind us of the fact that Jesus is the physical fulfillment of the Father's plan to save sinners from his righteous wrath. You see, within God's perfection, he decided to send a perfect Savior to provide salvation to sinners. Therefore, Jesus presents us with that picture of God's perfection. Now, in order to further explain what I mean by this, let's turn to John chapter 8, where we find the Lord Jesus. He's attempting to help the Jews to understand that he is the physical incarnation of Jehovah. And it's here in John chapter 8 where Jesus actually tells his audience, if you do not believe that I am, you will die in your sins. I don't believe translators did us any favors by putting the word he there. Because I think it takes away from what Jesus was actually saying. You see, it's important for us to understand here that the words I am were translated from the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew name that God presented to Moses. Therefore, when Jesus declares, if you do not believe that I am, you will die in your sins, he's actually saying this. To the ear of the Jew, listening to him there in the first century, they heard him say this, if you do not believe that I am the God who met Moses on Mount Horeb, then you will die in your sins. That's the way they heard it. And in order to further prove my point, let's look again here at John's account. Look with me there at John chapter 8, but let's skip down the page to a yet another story that, that is very similar. Look with me there at verse 53. There the Jews asked, asked Jesus, Are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead? 
and the prophets are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Now, if that just doesn't give you goosebumps, then you're not listening. He says, before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, I exist. Here again, Jesus is using the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew name that God gave himself there on Mount Horeb. And he drove home his point by insisting that he was Jehovah before Abraham was even born. And so, you know, let's not be confused here because Jesus has two natures. He is 100% man and 100% God at the same time. And while the human nature of Jesus was born on a specific day and time at a specific location here on earth, The deity of Jesus is one with the Father and the Holy Spirit, which means that they have existed, period. They are existence as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit exist within the Godhead. And listen, this is exactly what the Jews thought that he was saying. You see, I'm not forcing this interpretation on the text. This is what the Jews heard. As a matter of fact, look with me there at uh, verse 59. There in response to what Jesus just said about I am, John tells us that they took up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Now as we consider this response, if what they heard was just, hey, before Abraham was, I'm some dude. They wouldn't pick up stones to try to kill him. No, what they heard was blasphemy. What they heard was so blasphemous that they decided to pick up stones so that they could engage in capital punishment right there on the spot. They heard Jesus saying, before Abraham was, I am Jehovah. And they wanted to kill him for it. Now, I believe that there's further evidence for making this case. And if you would, let's turn forward two more chapters to John chapter 10, because there we find a very similar scenario playing out once again. And if you would look with me there at John 10, beginning at verse 24, because there John tells us that the Jews surrounded him and said to him, how long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answers them, I told you and you do not believe. He's saying, hey, remember back in John chapter 8? I told you. You wanted to kill me. And he says, the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life. Now, who can give eternal life except one who eternally exists. But there Jesus is saying, I give my sheep eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, many good works I've shown you from my father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him saying, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself God. Now I can't even tell you how many people I've met here in the 21st century who have told me, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. And yet, That's not what the Jews are saying here. 
these Jews are clearly understanding Jesus to, to be suggesting that he is God incarnate. And it's for this reason that they wanted to stone him to death. They explained that Jesus was deserving of death because he was claiming to be the physical incarnation of Jehovah. And listen, if the claim were false, then it would have been a blasphemous claim. If Jesus' claim was false, then, then he was engaging in blasphemy. But if the claim is true, then Jesus is indeed the Son of God and therefore the physical incarnation of Jehovah. So Jesus says, hey, test my works. And by that, I believe that he was pointing to his resurrection. He told the Jews that he was going to give them one sign that would be the sign of the prophet Jonah, that he would be in the earth for three days and then rise from the grave. If Jesus is risen from the grave, then I'm here to tell you that he is the physical incarnation of Jehovah God. And I believe that he has and that he is. Now remember, Jehovah is the infinite essence of pure, unchanging existence. Therefore, since Jesus is the incarnation of Jehovah, then I would conclude this study by pointing out that we can also trust him to forever be the gracious savior of those who place their faith in his finished work that he accomplished on the cross. I believe that we can forever trust in Jesus Christ because according to Paul in Hebrews 13, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Because Jesus is the physical incarnation of Jehovah and Jehovah never changes. Therefore, we can trust him. The promises that he's made He's going to fulfill. He's not like us. People who make promises and break promises and, you know, even the person who tries their, their, their hardest to be trustworthy is going to end up failing at some point. Not so with God. When God makes a promise, he keeps it. Because he's perfect. Perfect. And he'll always be perfect, today and forevermore. With that being the case, I would conclude our study tonight by reminding you of the promise that Jesus made there in John chapter 10. If you would look with me there again at verse 27, there Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. According to Jesus, those who have heard his voice and, and those who have come to him and received the eternal life that he offers to every sinner, th those who have come and repented of their sins and placed their faith entirely in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ can rest in the assurance that the God who is has also made this immutable, unchangeable promise that those who have been born again by faith in the promised Savior will never be separated from his everlasting love. I know there's Christians who believe that it's possible for us to lose our salvation and they live on this eternal roller coaster ride of today I'm saved and tomorrow I might not be. And What I hear Jesus telling me here is that those who have been born again by faith in his finished work will never perish. The unchanging, immutable God who is and will never, ever be anything other than what he is has told us that those who hear his voice and those who trust in him will never perish. And since Jehovah cannot change, then he can't change his mind about our salvation. I, if it were me, and I'm looking at me, and I offer me salvation at one point in time, and then I see what I do tomorrow, I'm thinking, eh, maybe I made a mistake. This guy, he's, he's not a good guy. 
the salvation that the Lord offers us, it's everlasting. And if the Lord has given you eternal life, then you will never perish. And that's a promise from Jehovah who will never change.